Nate, first of all, uh, the animation on the the big cats was pretty good. Like, I was great job. Like, I, <laughs> I when it first came on, I was like, did he just get some stock footage? And I was like, <laughs> no, you know. So, um, I thought uh, so really well done on that part and illustrations and, and all put together. It wasn't sensational. Uh, it was very like the words of, in their own words, you know, everyone telling their stories and what they had seen. Correct. Uh, you know, one thing, Nate, that I thought was I'm surprised by, have you not been contacted by anybody from the DNR about like at least some kind of statement? Like here's our official, like just sending out to make a clarification or an official statement. No, we have not. And we were, we, for during the whole course of the film, um, we, it, well, my mom, um, Linda Godfrey, what had been trying to reach out to uh, the DNR's large carnivore specialist, and they were going back and forth. And every time um, the interview came up, something would come up and he couldn't do it. And finally, you know, we we're, we we're done with the movie. And yeah, they didn't, they didn't make any official statement. Um, You'd think that you'd think they'd want to to do that, right? Right. Um, and so I was I was surprised by that. I was also surprised about the amount of people that had said they saw something. You know, I was expecting like, okay, the three or four people see a big cat. That's why it's easy to dismiss. But yeah. when you see there's so many people in the film that you get first person accounts from, um, was there anybody who, you know, it's not like seeing Bigfoot. Where mm -hmm. there is a stigma, was but was there anybody like there, um, yeah. who was a little bit reticent to come forward? There were many people that were reticent to come forward. Um, we do show a lot. We do show a lot of uh, the witnesses, but it is not even close um, to who's out there right now. Um, there, uh, Steve recently estimated that he published um, over two hundred witness accounts in the last thirty years, and half of those were black which is crazy. Um, but there, some of, some of the most dramatic witnesses, um, for whatever reason, did not want to come forward and be in the film. Um, some of them went on record with Steve, but, um, I actually have sort of a timeline, um, in, in my mom, in my mom's book, in the appendix, she has a great list of all these, uh, all these witnesses. Um, so I would say, you know, we, we we didn't get uh, many of the most dramatic ones on on camera, but yeah, we were really happy that they did come forward. And it's not like a you know, in that community, it's not it's not this cool thing that you saw the panther because a lot of people are kind of skeptical. Sure, but many people in the area have a, a a very good friend or a family member who has seen one, so they're kind of they look at it a little bit differently. Um, well, like you said before, you know, you guys spent a year working on this, on this film. And so why did you think the message is, is so important? Um, and because this is a different kind of cryptozoological film when you think about it, right? Because it's not going after the same Loch Ness monster. It's, it's saying, okay, there's a whole bunch of cats here. These are these are the creatures we know about. Um, why are they in Wisconsin? Why is the DNR not talking about it? Mm -hmm. Um and denying that it exists in the first place and that they could be a danger to wildlife or even people as you get to an end of the film. Um, why did you guys feel the message was so important that you're willing to make it such a big, big project in your life? Well, you know, when I, when we first started, I, you know, I wasn't, my mom told me the, the story of, of what's going on, but I didn't really get it till I went out there and started talking to people. And then it's just, there was a moment where, my my mind was just blown just imagining that there's actually these black cats walking around and people are seeing them um and the other reason is it's still happening this is an uh, this is, didn't end at any time um steve we had the sighting from robin uh he saw a black cat in his backyard while we were sh while we were still shooting the film but since then there's been multiple sightings of the black cat uh most recently steve stanick uh more or less came out of retirement to write more articles, got sort of re-energized by the film. And he's writing more articles. And I just saw one last night um, that reported a fourth grade, fourth grade teacher, Hillsborough teacher witnessed a really huge one. Um, he said 
like oh, 10 feet, uh, 10 feet from tip of the nose to the tail. It's a monster. So it's, it's huge. Yeah, it's, it's huge. So it's still happening. So, you know, I, I want to, I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to know, you know, what these things are and it's, it's just exciting, you know, you know, coming out, uh, you know, coming out this year, what has interest in Tiger King or the way that people were reacting? Because you have Wisconsin's Joe Exotic. I shouldn't call that. That guy's nothing like Joe Exotic. Um, but the the big cat rescue guy, he's probably more like Carol Baskins without the husband killing stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wow. But, you know, did, did the success of Tiger King earlier this year uh, give you guys a chance to get more publicity or get the word out more or get more stories? Um, you know, that was it was such a weird time when we released it because it was the beginning of, of COVID. And then so we didn't I don't think we really got that big of a boost from from the Tiger King fiasco. Uh, but yeah, it definitely, it, I guess it got a lot of people interested in the big cats, whether or not it had a big effect on us. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Well, you know, in your research, one thing that I'm, um, wondering is because there are so many collectors and as, um, mm -hmm. the, the big cat rescue guy was saying, he's like, there's no laws about it in the, um, there's no laws about it in Wisconsin in the rural areas. Yeah, and we see like you know, was it three years ago that we had the Milwaukee lion? With four mm -hmm. years ago, maybe that um, people were seeing a, a big cat running around, um, not even suburban Milwaukee. You know, just yeah. like areas of the city. And so, native creatures versus escaped animals from some kind of amateur zoo. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, um, after talking to Jeff, who's the owner of Big Cat Rescue, he's he's one uh, in terms of the native animals. He's one hundred percent certain that there are cougars that resident cougars in the state of Wisconsin. He says there's no way there's not. But the DNR's official, um, you know, official stance is that they're only animals coming from from the west, just passing through. Um, but we have, like in the film, we have a, a, a girl who witnessed, and she was she was riding along with a DNR agent at the time, and they witnessed a baby cougar right there. So if if you're, there's a baby cougar, then that means there's you know breeding animals in the area. Um, we have some other sightings. You know, we the sightings go from let's see here. Started in 1930, um, where Farmer John Rogers was riding a horse-drawn wagon and a black panther-like animal dropped down onto the back of one of its horses and just slid off and scampered away. That was going on in the 1930s. Um, 1940s, another farmer witnessed a black cat just south of Hillsborough. In the 50s, again, a farmer saw a huge black cat leave over the hood of his car in one bound and it turned into his driveway. It was five feet long without the tail. So these things have been going on and then in Going on to is sort of, I think Steve started writing the articles um, in the late 80s. So that's when the the documented sightings, there could have been just as many sightings back then, but no sure. one was writing articles constantly in the paper. Um, there's, let's see. Well, that's interesting then. So that, that really does point to the idea that these are native creatures and right. they're not but, it's not just part of some zoo gone awry, or as we were speculating in the comments, uh, the DNR doesn't want to talk about it because maybe yeah. they reintroduced big cats as a wildlife population control experiment and it got away from them. And they don't want to be known as the people who are like, yeah, we brought the big cats back because we thought it would help with the deer, um, but we don't know what happened to them. Or some kind of mutant black cougar. Like I've heard of like the black squirrels. Um, I don't know. There's not supposed – there's supposedly – this is the weirdest part is there's never – there's never been a black cougar that anyone has ever seen. So, so, you know, it, it's tough. Um, but we saw, so let me just quick find this. So at, at some point, let's see, there was a, a farmer saw two, that's two black 
what he called mountain lion kittens. Um, one one tan one, one tan mountain lion kitten, and that kitten, and then a black mother. So there's been sightings of tan and black at the same time as well. So it gets, you know, it's it's mysterious. Sure. Well, I mean, and cats in the same litter can also be differently colored. Um, at least house cats. I had uh, two American sure. long hairs, and one was a black cat, and the other was um, white and brown. And they both, you know, were, were from the same mom. Uh, Shane asks in the chat, I thought melanism was a potential trait for most of the cat family. Is it a case of we haven't caught or killed one or is it a case of this can't happen? Well, you know, it's nature. So I, I don't know about it can't happen, but they, yeah, it's, they've never caught or killed a melanistic, um, a melanistic cougar. So that, that trait apparently just isn't sure. um, in their in their genetic makeup, but you know, could one have bred at some point with something like a leopard? It'd be possible. And the 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 fact that they're seeing tan and black ones together with tan and black cubs sort of uh, you know lends a little bit to that theory as well. So um, also somebody was talking in the chat, they're saying, I don't know that they're, um, and let's switch modes from maybe the uh, strict flesh and bones cryptozoological yeah. aspect here um, to maybe something of the more uh, paranormal variety. Mm -hmm. And so someone was asking, like, I'm not convinced they're conventional creatures that the people are seeing. Now, have any of the reports in you guys got, and I know you focused really on the flesh and blood aspect uh, in this film. And that's probably the best way if you're trying to convince people uh, of the, like the DNR and stuff like that, you don't want to say, oh yeah, it's, it's the magic black Panther of Wisconsin, right? That's, that's an easy way for them to just write that off. Sure. Um, but going into that though, were there any reports that you got that seemed to almost have a paranormal quality? Um, not that I, not that I, we really ran up against any, anything like that. Um, generally it, it seems that these were, you know, flesh and blood creatures that behaved like cats um, and were pretty comfortable or more or less a little bit comfortable uh, around the humans. Like they, you know, they, they weren't running away. They would make eye contact with people. Um, so yeah, it's, but this, it's, it's strange. It, there's not there's not really any theory that completely clicks and makes perfect sense to me um, just because of the the time frame um, and then there's sightings going back there's this whole um, Laura Ingalls Wilder story right. um, so she's talking about her grandfather who was in Pepin Wisconsin you know wrestling this Black Panther in the late 1800s um, and then all the way through so it, I don't know. It doesn't escape the animals. Doesn't necessarily just solve everything. Right. Uh, now Bart uh, in in the chat. Bart says he mentions he saw a cougar a mountain lion. He saw was definitely tan. The tuft on the tail was a darker tan. So now yeah. Bart lives in Toma now. So Bart, was this when you were in Toma? In in that I mean, right? Toma, Wisconsin is not very far away from Viroqua, Hillsboro, and the Driftless area uh, at all. And so, uh, Bart, was that when you were in Wisconsin or was that when you were living in Iowa? I just, um, but just let us know in the chat because there we go. There's another, we have a, we have an experiencer right in the audience today. Um, well, speaking of the paranormal angle, um, one of the things that I thought was interesting actually came from, um, when I was, uh, oh, this Bart saw, Bart saw it in Iowa. Okay. Dyersville. Um, but I mean, that's Iowa to the southwestern part of Wisconsin. I mean, they're mm -hmm. on the border. Uh, if you saw them in Dyersville, there's no reason that they couldn't have crossed over to Wisconsin. Um, but the uh, a story I got from your mom, Nate, when I was looking for stories about Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. was uh, the story about how Williams Bay, which is on one corner of the lake, mm -hmm. was the place where in the traditional uh, Ojibwe legends, the Thunderbird, the god of the air and the sky, fought the water panther, mm. the god of the underworld. And so um, when somebody was talking about, in, in the movie, they were talking about how 
is there a chance that South American wildlife is migrating to, or has been migrating to North America? And that made me think of actually um, something that my sister was researching, and that was water panther legends. Uh, mm-hmm. in the, so water panther also known as the Mishupishu, um, is this God and God, it, it, God is a weird word in the Ojibwe legends. So I don't necessarily mean it like we think of like a Greek God or Christian God, but mm-hmm. it's a powerful supernatural figure. And, um, well, it's represented as like a, a feline. It also has horns, mm-hmm. yes. um, and scales and stuff, but it's like body ridges like a stegosaurus. I think that's the one, mm-hmm. you know, sawtooth back. Yeah. And, uh, but it's all, I mean, it's a, the main body is a cat that they call it the water panther. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, Allison's theory is that it might be, um, people had seen jaguars mm-hmm. as you know, in the, in, if they could have come it's into North America and they could have seen jaguars. And then that starts the legend of, well, be careful when you're by the thing. Cause there's a, there's a giant um, predator. That will, around the- yeah. Get you in the water. They're incredible <laughs> swimmers. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's really interesting. Um, it, you know, who knows how these, these stories form and why the, you know, the antlers and the, that sort of throws, throws me off a little bit. But um, yeah, no, Jaguars, it's a possibility. And Sharon Richardson, um, who is the, uh, the PhD who studied Florida Panthers, mm-hmm. she talked for a while. She said it's not, it's not impossible. There could be some sort of um, you know, migration from South America. Jaguars, there's, they're, in, they're in Arizona. They've come up. Um, you know, it's possible. And so that's what I think is interesting is because now we're talking about, um, you know, these real animals inspiring sure. legends mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, we have now, uh, cat sightings in Wisconsin that they say they are, they can't possibly be. And right. so, you know, that aspect of it where, okay, um, these it may they may have seen these things far past the 1880s. You know, we mm-hmm. talk about Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, if you think about the Native Americans, they could have been having those sightings, you know, for thousands of years. And so I think somebody in the uh chat is putting in um the uh the captions, the automatic captioning. So I'm not quite sure why. Uh but all right. Uh, anybody, any last, we have a few minutes left with Nate. So any last questions in particular about the film? Um, Noel Thomas says, there was a girl who said 200 of the animals are spirit animals and another 200 are flesh and blood. Um, Noel, would you care to um, elaborate on that a little bit? Like two, why 200? Um, who was the girl who said that? Uh and, you know, anything, if, if you have any more comments like that, no, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the spirit animals. You know, that's another thing too, though. Um, this idea that some of the animals that people could be seeing, um, you know, the ones that you think are more traditional, like when Bart said he saw a tan cougar in mm-hmm. Eastern Iowa, mm-hmm. um, versus somebody seeing a black panther which they say there's never been a report of a black panther in naturally in wisconsin outside of um jeff's big cat rescue and then, supposedly the whole united states and oh really North america there's never okay. been a, a, a black a wild panther ever documented or approved so and so so that kind of thing is okay so maybe when they're seeing the black panther that's the spirit animal and yeah. when you see the cougar or you, you see the tan animal, um, that's the flesh and blood. You know, they, like, as a girl describes when she, obviously she's with a DNR agent and she sees, uh, you know, a cougar baby in a mother's jaw, you know, it's going to be something like, well, okay. How do you, how do you say that now that they're not around when you're right. with, you know, I'd be interested um, in finding that DNR agent and being like, Hey, did you really see that? And he's like, if I, if I tell you that will kill me. <laughs> um, well, I, I believe my mom had contacted that agent and she, she denied it. 
Oh, really? She denied it. Yeah. She said, oh, that was some kind of bobcat. But when you when you talk to our witness, she explains it like, you know, they talked about it. They talked about it being a cougar baby. So uh, there's something where the, you know, the DNR just does not want to admit that. Um, having a baby there is a very big deal for them, having a baby cougar cub. So Okay. All right. That no, that that adds a adds a wrinkle to the story, right? Because mm -hmm. now you have the official um the official denial from the feds. Not the yeah, feds, exactly. The stadies, I don't know what to call them. Stadies. Um that's great. Okay, so Nate, what's next uh for White Lhasa? Lhasa? What what's your next in the plan or an, another kind of documentary you're working on? Yeah. Um now that you got Wildcat Mountain out, and once again, we encourage everybody to leave an Amazon review if you're with us today, you had a chance to watch the entire film. Um, and even if you're watching, uh, you know, during this week, uh, still please, you'll see that offer sign, go, go leave a review, send me an email, Mike at American ghostwalks.com, send you a coupon. Um, Noelle says she said she was an animal sensitive and there's a video clip where she channeled Dobar, the black Panther and an animal rescue in the film. Dobar reported that what he knows. So it was a paranormal telepathic event dobar the black panther well i think it was a typo dozer noelle's actually oh. my girlfriend so she's writing this in. okay um and she had a connection with dozer who was that the the left black leopard yeah that's at the at the animal rescue so very interesting oh, okay all right so that's that's interesting right mm-hmm um i i love i uh First of all, I'd love to be able to see what my cats were thinking. Because usually when I talk to my, you know, I'm usually with my cats are thinking, I'm bored, I hate you, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, so that, that's interesting, animal sensitive. Um, yes, okay, Dozer. Uh, that's, in, that's, that's an interesting thing. So that's a cool paranormal idea. Thank you, Noel, uh, for sharing that. Oh, to get back to the question, um, what's up next? So what's what's the plan for your next documentary? Are you guys going to continue to make things like this? Or well, are you like, we're all big catted out? Um, somehow, you know, I took a little break from it. I was a little burnt out from the big cats. But now that I know there's there's things, there's it's still happening. Um, I'm going to just kind of continue on this project and hopefully get more interviews, maybe put them out in a different way. Um, and there's one, there's one project. So there was some other sort of paranormal things that had happened that we didn't get to fit in the film, but we shot. So in, let's see, 19, let's see here. Yeah, so the 1948 flying fence post incident. This was um, in, 19, in 1948, there was a farmer who witnessed two giant cigar shaped cylinder craft flying in flying in perfect tandem and it went over his his field and they called it the flying fence post and then they slowed down and they turned on end and then continued on like it was very strange um and we had one of the witnesses from that was 11 years old at the time and we interview him about about the the whole ufo incident this was back in 1948, so they no, no one was really talking about UFOs at that point. Right. I don't think. Um, so we're, I want to do a little mini documentary to put that out, and you know that's that's the next thing I'm working on. Okay, so some of the some of the stuff you shot uh, also has elements of the high strangeness aspect Absolutely. to it. Um, were there any other uh, connections? like that where you found where you're talking to somebody and they maybe had a UFO sighting or a ghost sighting or something else. And then also had a black cat sighting with somebody like, yeah, I've seen some stuff. Um, no, we haven't. Well, he, one of the witnesses did have that, but it, he never connected it necessarily right to the black cat. So no, we didn't have anything like that actually. Okay. Okay. But that, um, that does, once now that we've done the flesh and blood one, uh, we can see what happens when we when we channel Dozer. Yes, uh, we you know, uh, and see if we can find some of those spirit animals. I think that that will be the next video. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing more. Uh, Nate, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you thank for you. sharing your brilliant film. Um, 